as far as the eye could see. Today, the buffalo are mostly gone. So too are the people who hunted them. The people who called this land their home. The people of the plains. The people of the plains had many names. Crow, Arapaho, Sioux. Each had different names. Each spoke different languages. But they all hunted the buffalo. Where the buffalo went, so did the people. The buffalo provided food, clothing, and shelter. Riding on horseback, the plains people were bold and efficient hunters. But the plains people never hunted for sport. They only killed to feed and clothe themselves. After all, to them the buffalo, as with all living things, was sacred and possessed a spirit life. Everything in nature, the grass, the wind, the water, they all possessed a spirit life, and all were to be respected. Everything in the natural world had a reason for being here, and everything was connected to everything else in a spiritual way. But there were also evil spirits in the world, and when things went wrong, like drought, famine, disease, it was usually because of the evil spirits. Medicine men were said to have a special knowledge of the spiritual world and were called upon to make things right again, sometimes by conducting ceremonies and dances where the people would become in better touch with the natural world around them. Respect for the natural world is evident in nearly everything the Plains people did. Many of their possessions were adorned with animal likenesses. Their ceremonial pipes were not only colorful, but were sometimes carved with animal figures. And so too were many of their cooking and eating utensils. These serving spoons were carved from buffalo and ram horns. Their ceremonial clothing was among the most beautiful of all Native Americans. And so were the dolls they made for their children. This headdress was worn by a warrior who performed many acts of bravery, each feather representing some heroic deed. While they didn't have a written language, many Plains tribes kept track of important events by painting pictures on buffalo hides. Each picture stands for one year. Who were the Plains people? Where did they come from? How did they get here? While many Native Americans explain their origin in a different way, most anthropologists believe the following. About 30,000 years ago, North America looked much like it does today. A narrow stretch of ocean separated Asia from this continent. There were no people living here. Then ice began to advance across the northern hemisphere. As it did, sea levels dropped, exposing a land bridge connecting Asia with North America. Large game animals like bison and mammoth crossed this land bridge, entering the new continent, soon followed by Asian hunters. There were probably several migrations over thousands of years, and eventually the people spread throughout North and South America before the ice retreated and the land bridge became covered by water again. There were hundreds of tribes, but each can be classified into one of several groups according to the natural environment in which they lived. 
The names of these groups are the Eastern Woodlands, the Plains, the Southwest, the Great Basin, the Plateau, California, and the Northwest Coast. Each of these groups lived in an environment that was unlike the others. None of the others lived in an environment that was quite like this one, the land of the Plains people. The Plains is made up of gently rolling land covered by tall grass and few trees. The land is ideal for the buffalo which once roamed here, grazing on the wild grasses the buffalo were free to migrate hundreds, even thousands of miles, following the same pathways year after year. And where the buffalo went, the people followed. They were nomads, following a nomadic life, always on the move, never in one place for long. What would it have been like to have lived back then, to have followed the buffalo? to have lived like the Plains people. We had not seen buffalo for many days. If they are anywhere near, my father would find them. He is one of the best in our village at finding the trail of the buffalo. He is called Strongbow. The other man is called Big Horse, my father's friend. I am called Weakaluta. It means red feather. I've lived for 12 winters, and usually boys my age don't get to ride with their fathers. But my father says I'll soon be ready for the hunt myself, and I must learn the ways of the buffalo. For the buffalo is all important. Without it, we would not be able to live the way we do. Our very homes are made from the buffalo. Our teepees have been sewn together from buffalo hides. A teepee makes a very nice home, and it is very quick to set up, which is a good thing because we're never in one place for long. My mother, sound of the wind, always sets up our teepee. She does so with help of another woman in the village. First, three lodge poles are set up to make the basic shape of the teepee. Thinner poles are placed between the three main poles. All the poles are then bound together. Shunka, our dog, enjoys watching the work. Buffalo hides are then draped over the poles. This is hard work because buffalo hides are very heavy and a total of 18 hides are used to cover one teepee. stretch tight and peg around the outside edge. The hammer my mother is using is made from an elk antler. While my mother puts up the real teepee, my little sister, runs like a rabbit, practices printing one up herself. This is how we learn things, by copying our parents. After the teepee is up, my mother will clear a place inside for our fire. She is using a buffalo horn to scrape away the grass. The fire will keep our teepee warm on the coldest of nights, and it can also be used for cooking. Before the fire is lit, flaps at the top of the teepee are open to let out smoke. Next, my mother places buffalo robes on the ground to make a nice soft floor. She sets up backrest. These are made out of sticks. And lays out a couple of pillows which are filled with soft buffalo hair. A teepee can be a very comfortable place. 
One of the last things my mother does is to hang our wind chime. It is made from buffalo hooves and makes pretty sounds when the wind blows against the teepee. After the teepee is set up, my mother will build a fire. Dry grass is placed between two pieces of wood. Next, she uses a bow and a spinning stick. The spinning causes the wood to heat up. She has to spin very fast, but soon the grass begins to smoke. Then, at just the right moment, my mother will stop spinning so that she can blow on smoking grass. Until finally, a flame appears. She'll add bigger and bigger sticks to the flame until there is a real fire. After the fire has been burning a while, my mother will remove one of the hot rocks. This is placed in a cooking bag. The rock will cause the water to boil in a very short time. After which, my mother will add some pieces of buffalo meat, which we eat practically all the time. As well as some prairie turnips, which grow wild just about everywhere. Runs like a rabbit, likes to add the final seasoning. In this case, some spearmint leaves. I almost forgot, the cookie bag is actually the stomach of a buffalo. It never leaks, even with boiling water inside. While my mother is cooking, my father will usually make tools and weapons. Our bows are made from tree branches. After removing the bark, a branch is carved to the proper shape using a stone scraper. It can take a long time, but gradually the bow takes shape. The bowstring is made from sinew, dried buffalo tendons. It first has to be shredded into thin strands. We use buffalo sinew to make thread, string, and rope. Two strands have to be twisted and braided together. A freshly made bowstring is almost impossible to break. Arrows are made from carefully selected branches of the currant bush. The bark first has to be scraped away, again using a stone scraper. It is then sanded between two coarse rocks, and then straightened using a buffalo bone with a hole in it. Straightening is very important because if an arrow isn't straight, it won't fly straight. Arrowheads are chipped from flint. The final touch is being done with a deer antler. The arrowhead is then tied to the shaft with sinew. The same for the feathers. They are tied to the shaft with sinew. Then covered with a coating of glue, which is made from buffalo hide. A properly made bow and arrow in the right hands is a very deadly weapon. A single shot, aimed properly, can bring down a buffalo at full gallop. isn't all we do. There's usually time for games, at least for children, like buffalo hunt. It's not only a lot of fun, but it teaches us to be buffalo hunters. Throw one up like a ball is always a lot of fun. Girls especially like it because they get to throw small boys into the air. The hoop game also teaches us to be better hunters. Thank you.
The girls think it's funny when we miss, but sometimes we make it. Shinny is another popular game. The object here is to hit a ball into your opponent's ball. We still have not found the buffalo, and so my father decides to stop and eat. My job is water boy, and that means I must fetch water for the men. The water bag I'm using is made from a buffalo bladder. It's very strong, and like a buffalo stomach, hardly ever leaks. It is very handy to have on a trip. Another job of the water boy is to cool down the horses so they'll be fresh for the rest of the day. Back at the village, my mother is making a new dress. She starts by drawing an outline on a deer skin using a marking stone. Then, using a flint knife, she cuts the pattern out. This will be a dress for runs like a rabbit, but it's only half done. My mother will next stitch this half with the matching half. First, using a bone awl to make some holes, and then sewing the two pieces together with sinew. This is an everyday dress, so it won't be decorated. But many of our things are beautifully decorated. One woman in our village is well known for her beautiful embroidery. She does it by wrapping dyed porcupine quills around sections of buffalo or deer skin. This takes a lot of time. It will take several passings of the moon to finish a beautiful bag like this. Finally, we have found the buffalo. But there is a problem. There are many calves, which mean the buffalo will be very cautious. They'll run with the slightest noise. My father decides it will be best to use a sneak attack. He has brought a wolf skin for this very purpose. Wolves frequently follow the buffalo, and the buffalo are used to their presence. The buffalo will not be frightened by a single wolf. My father will hunt alone using his bow and arrow. frighten the buffalo. Buffalo hunting is dangerous. Several men in our village have been killed by charging bull buffaloes. It can take a long time to get close enough to shoot. Today, the hunters were fortunate, but little did they know their days as buffalo hunters were coming to an end. A new people had entered America. Soon the new Americans, the European Americans, would enter the plains, and when they did, 
the way of the plains people would never be the same again. Wanting the land occupied by Indians, the new Americans engaged in a series of conflicts that would eventually result in the complete conquest of the Plains people and all Native Americans. Indians everywhere were forced to give up their way of life and to live on small reservations, areas of land set aside for Indians. No longer able to hunt and fish in the old ways, the Indians were rationed food and clothing by the government. Some agents who were supposed to help the Indians were dishonest. They stole money and supplies, so the Indians never got all that they were entitled to. As a result, the Indians lived in total poverty and many starved. Tribes were forced to give up many of their traditions and could no longer perform many of their religious rites and ceremonies. Many Indian children were separated from their families and were sent to strict boarding schools where they were forced to give up their Indian ways. In the 1950s, the government encouraged Native Americans to relocate to the nation's cities where they could find jobs and live in modern ways. But not all Indians chose to do this. Today, Indians can live anywhere they want and many choose to live off reservations in cities and towns, employed in the same sorts of jobs as other Americans. But more than a half million Indians prefer to remain on reservations located throughout the United States. Life here is better than it used to be, and in some ways is similar to life anywhere else. Indians drive cars and live in modern dwellings like other Americans. They dress in modern clothing. They shop in stores. Many attend Christian churches. Indian children go to schools that look like schools anywhere and study the same kinds of subjects. They play the same sorts of games and enjoy the same things as other American children. While reservation life is a lot like life anywhere else, there are some big differences. Unemployment is very high. On some reservations, four out of five people are out of work. And because of it, alcoholism and poverty are widespread. No one knows that better than Sergeant Wendell Yellowbull of the Pine Ridge Reservation Police. Due to lack, lack of money, Unemployment is very high. Jobs are not available. We have young kids, high school kids come in graduating, needing jobs and the jobs are not there. And this leads to a lot of excessive time, boredom, and the alcohol and the drugs seem to be uh, a way to go. In recent years, many tribes have opened casinos in order to create jobs and bring in additional income. But only a few tribes, those near major cities, have actually profited from casinos. A few Native Americans are able to earn incomes by selling their arts and crafts. Shane Espinosa is learning to tan hides in the way his ancestors did before him. Deer hides like this were used by Plains Indians to make dresses, shirts, and other types of clothing. Today, Shane sells his hides to earn needed money for himself and his family. Another longtime craft of many Plains tribes is porcupine quill work. Dolores Yellowbull, a Lakota Sioux, is working on a quill work piece she hopes to sell. The quills must first be softened, which is done by soaking them in the mouth. They are then wrapped around sections of deer hide. Quill work is used to decorate many items, like these wrist cuffs and barrettes. Mark Zimica 
has been carving ceremonial pipe bowls since he was a boy and has gone on to become one of the world's best pipe makers. While Mark uses some modern techniques, his pipe bowls are similar in style to bowls that have been carved for many generations and will sell for hundreds of dollars. Crafts like these not only bring in needed income, but they enable craftspeople to stay in touch with their traditional ways, and that's important to many Indians. That's why on many reservations, Indians are participating in ancient ceremonies, like the sweat lodge ceremony being prepared here by a spiritual leader and his assistant. Before the ceremony begins, hot rocks are brought into the lodge. Water will be poured on the rocks, creating steam. People will take their places in the lodge to pray, to sing, and to be physically and spiritually purified. One of the most exciting events on reservations are powwows, where Indians come together and participate in many activities like dancing. Dancing is not only fun, but the best dancers can earn thousands of dollars in prize money. There are separate divisions for men, women, and even children. Another popular attraction at many powwows is the rodeo. And one of the most popular parts of the rodeo is the bull riding competition. Here, Indian riders get to compete for thousands of dollars in prize money. It seems fitting that Native Americans, once among the greatest riders in the world, are now among the best on the rodeo circuit. Today, the teepees are gone, and so too the vast buffalo herds that once roamed this land. But when the light is just right, and you happen to be looking, you can still find evidence of an earlier place in time. What we found, Annie? Look! Wow! What is it? It's an arrowhead. I bet she's from when the Indians were around. And maybe, just maybe, the arrowhead might have belonged to three hunters, one of them named Red Feather, who passed this way nearly 200 years ago.